Greetings, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm going to take a big risk here and go into what my prison life was like and try to tie this all into uh, what I've been talking about with this New Age decree and how it's not biblical and how it's really New Age. Let me pull up my computer because I want to finish with Matthew, or I'm sorry, Luke, what Jesus is teaching us. Jesus is teaching us in the parables. He's, he's showing us if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you understand the kingdom. So we hear about ki uh, the kingdom a lot. Studying, his, studying the parables, I would highly recommend David Jeremiah. He's published two, over 200 books, Turning Point Ministries, Doctor, Ph.D., the two books I'd recommend that get into the parables and how they fit with Revelation and just the whole Bible and to help you understand how narrow is that way and how there's different levels of judgment and heavenly inheritance is the book of signs and the apocalypse. Wow, really, op I mean, he really, really opens up scripture. Another one I obviously like is uh, David Hawking, the prophecy scholar who sent the miracle letter in. Okay, so now let me really confess here, you guys. So when Jesus allowed, by the power of the Holy Spirit, allowed me to have that amazing repentance where I realized everything was against him. I had lost a limo business. I lost $50,000. I had seven years of a prison sentence left. Drug trafficker. Blamed everything on a bad childhood. Violence and rationalized everything as a believer okay well now he starts urging me to start writing I believe on it I start writing that didn't mean so let me talk about how warfare is in prison in jails and my life had culminated in being a drug trafficker San Bernardino I mean I'd seen people die it was pretty gnarly and a lot of violence in prison just my life was built going that direction and so as I'm writing my pride was still there big time because it wasn't like I was just going to go PC which means protective custody because Jesus is working on me and now he's showing me I'm going to start writing so I was still carrying my sword and The, the other thing I could have done was go protective custody, which just goes against a prideful individual like me. So I didn't. I said, okay, I'm going to finish this all out the way I have been living. And so when you're in prison, every race has somebody who is in charge of that race for the safety of that race. You have the Mexicans, the Southern Mexicans in Northern California, the Northern Mexicans, the blacks, they're split up in bloods and crips. Um, the others, the Asians, the, the Vietnamese, and you have the, the, the cartel dudes, the Paisas, and you have the whites, and the whites are heavily outnumbered. What do you think the biggest thing for violence is in there? It's drugs. It's the drug war. So whoever's running the yard for the, for the whites, the biggest concern would be not having people run up drug debts, not pay it, or get into a little fight to not have to pay it, and then the whole race have to pay it. These are things that cause riots. When I, get up to, when I got up to Sentinella on the border of Mexico, level three, level four, I got to a yard that had a gnarly riot where the whites were so outnumbered, 18 to 19 Mexicans were stomping each white person and they had a mandatory get back up, which means after the, the guns, boom, 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 the, the block guns, all that, the pepper spray canisters this big, they hopped up to show their supremacy and started stomping on people that were already unconscious. 18 people got carted off on a stretcher. That's the yard I showed up to and decided to take the initiative and take over the yard and be a, uh, for the whites. And so in that situation, I still had my sword. I'm still riding. I'm, my, I'm, I'm going to get out in about three years at this point. And so in there, perception is reality. You have to live by the sword. 
You have to. Through running the yard diplomatically, a lot of the Mexican mob guys knew who I was by reputation from the drug war, from San Bernardino, from my prior reputation. I had my own problems with my own people, my own race, the white people. So I had to live by the sword. And at one point, the prison guards realized I was running the yard pretty well for the whites. And they asked us if we wanted to deal with any, any skeletons on the yard. And I'm like, that doesn't sound good. There was a child molester with 44 counts of ANNLY molest. And so here I am in a position where if I don't deal with it, I could get stabbed. That's what life is like in there. This is what my pride had led to, to the culmination of it on a level four yard on the border of Mexico. And here's where it gets even crazier. The dude who had all those pedophile charges on a kid was hiding among the Christians. And so here I am asking the Lord, what do I do? I didn't want to make somebody else do it. I've written books about all this stuff. I do not market those books. You don't see me marketing those books. You don't see me marketing the great reviews I get on those books. I do mentor some people on my YouTube channel that have read those books, that see I'm preaching the gospel. That's part of my history back then. This is about 2006. Prison guards gave us this information. I didn't want to put it on a kid to do it. I knew how to do it myself. I enlisted one of the other guys who had been in through the wars a lot. And we went and handled it and, and cut his face. We didn't kill him. That was my pride. Perception is reality in there. Thank God I got out in 2008, September, seven years. I had to start over. I went from being a drug trafficker to somebody who had to not, had to start over. I even went through a homeless shelter at one point, but I had the hope of writing. Okay, so I published 10 books on the drug war in prisons. And now I start publishing other books, self-help books. I started to see if the mind can perceive and believe you can achieve. Okay, and that's what sells. So here I am learning publishing and I see that that's what sells. And I see it's really new age because if we're talking biblically, that's me being God. God is bigger than what my mind can perceive. He's way bigger I'm only allowed to believe what he allows me to believe by the understanding of his word. And so I did a lot of writing on that stuff, you guys. I, was, I might put a link in this about public domain. Disney, all they do, over 50% of their movies is taking public domain and remaking it. And so I saw that in the publishing world. I'm like, okay. And I started doing that kind of stuff to publish more and more books. When I say I've published 70 books, it's well over that. I just say 70 because those are the ones I've written. But so what I'm getting at is I can see what sells. Like that's why I'm not targeting the decreeing that's as if I'm God. I can see it because I live through some gnarly stuff. That's why I love seeing the new age guys who are saying, like, what are you guys doing in the church? We just came out of this stuff. Like, they see it from their perspective. I see it from their perspective because I slightly saw it from the publishing world. I saw it from my, when I was carrying my sword. I could see it. Now let's go into Matt. Let's go into uh, the Gospels. Let's go into Luke. This is a really risky video for me, you guys, to admit all this stuff about my past. Now, let me, let me, before I get into this, if you were to ask me if I would have been going to heaven or hell, I'm a believer, absolutely believed my mom as, when I was a kid, the spiritual war, she taught me so many things, 
I understood, I believed. So I believe I was saved because I believed that it was Jesus' finished work on the cross. Okay? It wasn't about my works. I believe if I would have died in that, based on me believing that I believed, I'd go to heaven. But I wouldn't preach that way. I wouldn't preach the wide path because we don't know. The whole thing comes down to is if you believe his finished work on the cross. If you believe that's the only way to heaven and it's not your righteousness. Okay. I wanted to get that out of the way. Now, in Luke, we see Jesus is telling us parables. And when you look at the parables in Luke 13, Luke 14, and Luke 15, Luke 12, Luke 13, Luke 14 is where we're going right now. You see him talking about the kingdom all the way to the final banquet feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? And he's showing us how following him, he's, he's, showing, the, he's showing us the Pharisees that were hypocritical. They were putting man-made laws on top of the Sabbath. They even said that you couldn't even carry bags unless you carried it on this side of your hand. You couldn't carry it like this. You couldn't carry it like this. They had to make up so many things to make them more important. They made it so you had to wash your hands like a certain way. They just went over the top with what God had said to do. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms, they went over the top and they held in their great learning and they made it harder for people to get into the kingdom because they tried to act like they were perfect and they held the perfect understanding. And so Jesus is putting them in check and it's always a heart check. And so now in, in Luke 14, we see that they're trying to trap him. Another thing we see that the Pharisees did is they didn't want the testimony of Jesus to get out. When Jesus healed the blind guy, they had to go ask his parents, was he really blind? And then the, the, the blind guy put the Pharisees in check and, said, and, and they rebuked him and said, you're just a sinner. And so they didn't want the testimony out. And when you study these parables, you really see he's showing you that there's going to be an apostasy. If you have eyes to see, read the parables. He's showing you that it's going to get corrupt. Jesus is explaining, you guys have messed up the Sabbath. The Sabbath is about honoring God. That's the day of rest. We start thanking him for everything he did. We give him honor. We give him praise. We stop working for that day and we rest in his finished work. But that doesn't mean that you don't heal people. That doesn't mean that you don't untie your donkey or get your donkey out of a... You would protect an animal, right? You wouldn't just walk by an animal. And Jesus is showing him that. And now we see this parable of, of who is invited. And he's telling him, he's showing us that don't sit at the high seat. Don't be the Pharisee who's chasing after popularity. Uh, earlier, Jesus rebuked them saying, you're trying to act like you were for the prophets that are now popular 100 years later, 200 years later, 300 years later. The prophets that you guys killed. You're of your father, the devil. He calls them out. Okay? And now they want to be popular. So Jesus is decreeing truth. He's decreeing strive to enter the narrow gate. He's, he's decreeing count the cost before you even start your ministry. Are you willing to go to the very end knowing that you might have to die for me? 
That's what he's saying in Luke. In all the Gospels. But in Luke is to the Gentiles. Most scholars look at it like Matthew to the Jews. All scripture is good for reproof, teaching, rebuke, edifying the body. I think when we just try to say that, oh, that's to the Jews. That's not for us. You're, you're misinterpreting grace. You've got a doctrine of demons. I'm like, I just mentioned a Bible verse. And then I measure it up with other Bible verses. Are you telling me that all of those are for the Jews? And now that we can live however we want? Well, then look at the parables. The parables are explaining the kingdom. So we see not to sit at the highest place of honor because if someone comes in of greater honor, you're going to look dumb. Instead, sit in a position where, where you're not taking the highest seat. Let God lift you up. Be honest. Be truthful. Your past is, is, is part of your testimony. I don't like to, I don't bring up the past very much anymore because that's, that's the past past. But if it edifies the body, it's okay to, as long as it's not glorifying the past. It's edifying the sanctification process. So it's showing, okay, this is where God got a hold of me. This is where my pride was still in the way. I can see it. And I, and I can see that it's still a problem that I always have to look at. So let's keep going in these parables in Luke 14. So it starts with a, a dinner feast at a wedding and not wanting the best seat. And then it goes into not expecting to be repaid for what you're doing. Okay? Consider this with people that are saying, sow a seed, send me $777 and you will be blessed. And when you hear that, you can measure that up with what the Catholics did, the popes, when they were getting dead relatives to give them money so that they could pray the dead relatives out of hell or the holding place into heaven. That's similar. That's acting as if you're God, like come to me. Give me the money and you will be blessed. That's new age. That's not biblical. Yeah, we have reaping and sowing. But in no part does God say, I want one man to stand in between as the mediator for reaping and sowing. So Jesus is showing us that in this parable where he's talking about Give to the poor and not expect to have anything returned. Okay? Now this one gets really beautiful. He's talking about the invitation. And I believe this invitation is God to all flesh through his son, Jesus Christ. And this is an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he gives us the parable here saying, okay, before we get to that parable, we have somebody that's listening that understands that he's talking about, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God, because that's an Old Testament reference to the great banquet with the Messiah. And so this guy that's listening, he he remembers this, And so Jesus starts keying in on that. And we see in Revelation 19.9, as the marriage supper of the Lamb, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the parable starts going into that. Now Jesus Christ is showing us how our own thinking, our own pride can keep us from him. And he tells us this, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they are, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have a married wife and therefore I cannot come. 
This looks to be the banquet at the end of the age that we all have an invitation through faith in Jesus Christ and following him over the world. The first excuse we see not to come is being tied to our own prosperity with material things. The second excuse is we put our family and friends above God. So my question to you, brothers and sisters, right now is if the rapture was right now. Now, this is just an analogy. And God showed you that half your family wasn't going or your friends weren't going. Would you let go of that? Would you, let, would you go with him? If your husband, if your wife, if your son, if half your church, if your pastor, would you be too busy with the love of this, the love of this life to even be raptured? That's a question to think of. Are you too tied to your property? Are you too tied to me, 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 my ministry? I have things that are doing. I'm doing these things. Okay, that's, that's the question. Now watch us unpack the rest of this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring that point home more and more. So then Jesus says, So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house got angry and said to his servant, So look at this. Jesus did everything on the cross to save us and bring us back into fellowship with the Father for eternity. That's our eternal destiny. Okay, so the father, I believe in this parable, is angry, saying to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring here in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, master, it is done as you commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. This parable could imply that those who were first invited loved the world and made excuses that bring this angry response. So look at who are who's he who's gonna accept it? The poor in the spirit. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's the parable tying to that. The maimed. The poor in spirit. We have another parable where Jesus in Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man's like, hey, I didn't know. Go tell my brothers. What does Jesus say? He says, they, they, if they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets. Okay? So the poor in the spirit are the ones willing to give it up at all. Get, take it, just, so it's blessing, blessed to be. To, that's why he says it's so hard for a rich man. It's so hard for a popular man. If you need a bunch of likes, if you're living off your likes, are you tied to this world? So we even see that there's more room than was filled. That's how tied people were to the world in this parable. The maimed came. Jesus Christ hones in further to put him above everything. Now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So we play with all the pretty verses and we don't touch these ones. Now this one, I'm not going to interpret it like I have all knowledge. But what Jesus is saying is deny yourself over your family. That means to not that means to give all your family to him. They're his. And that you, you by 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 putting first the kingdom of God absolutely first, that is going to be good leadership. Better leadership than needing the world's leadership. Now that, what the mind can perceive and believe it can achieve is one of the best-selling books in the world. How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's the ways of the world. It's the psychologies of the world. It's how to get ahead. It's how to manipulate. That's what that is.
Jesus Christ sharpens the sword even further and says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We have to be willing to ask God what our cross is he wants us to carry. So this is like something, I don't, I don't know what you want me to do, Lord. That's why I'm always saying, search my heart. In Psalm, David says, who can know the heart? Search my heart, O Lord. I don't know where I'm still in your way. Search my heart. Show me. Reveal my pride. Where, what, do I, what, what do you have for me, Lord? That is, that is a, a, a walking in repentant attempt for me. That's the best I'm coming up with at this part of my sanctification. It's going back to the Bible. Decreeing what the Bible says and not decreeing only the verses that say, give me, give me, give me. Let's look at what the cross was then. Okay, this was, the cross then was a cursed way to die. It was the most humiliating, torturous way for a person to be exposed publicly, brutalized with a whip, hammered down, punched the Roman centurions. It was a horrible death. Okay, that's why I believe so much. Not only all the prophecy, but nobody would go to their death knowing that he rose from the dead. And he came and showed himself to 500 witnesses. And they were willing to die this horrible death on a cross. After seeing a lot of violence, that's another proof. Okay, so let's keep going. We're almost done. Jesus Christ tells us to measure the cost of following him before you start. For which of you intending to build a tower? And this is where he's showing you. Look, if, if, if you're in ministry, look to, to the very end. And, and, and measure it. And this is against apostasy. This is his teaching that we seem to have overlooked. So he says, which of you intending to build a tower... A tower is something you can go up high and look and see. I'm going to go all the way, the distance. Am I willing to do what he said all the way to the end? From the tower. And now he's saying that you're going to count the cost. Am I willing? Am I willing to die for him? Am I willing to be martyred for him? Martyr is a word that means witness. And he says, in, in case you don't do it that way, you might lay the foundation and not be able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else why? Or else while... The other is still a great way off. He sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. So he's breaking it down like a lawn chair halfway through it. He's giving into the world halfway through it. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is a kingdom warning against apostasy. Read John chapter 17, I believe. And it's the prayer that Jesus has for the disciples. And then for us that come after and John 17, 17 is sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. So if we stay in his word, completely foundational in his word, we won't apostatize. Here we see it like a military man who has to count the cost of the entire battle before he starts. Jesus Christ is asking, can you deny yourself all the way to the end? Okay, now here's another beautiful picture. So I'm telling you guys, the parables, you want to get into understanding the kingdom, the parables open it up, boom. And I, I again point to somebody with a far better ex, exegesis, uh, historical, bigger mind than mine, David Jeremiah, the book of signs, the apocalypse, David Hawking, he is such a humble servant. The book I'm reading right now, I don't even believe it's available on Amazon. He, he's so humble. But oh my gosh, does he open up scripture. Now we're looking at salt. Salt is a preservative. So we are the preservatives of him for this earth. 
Salt is good, but if the salt lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salt is a preservative and adds flavor. If it loses its saltiness, it is worthless. Now let's look at another another teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5, 12, 14 to add to this part of the salt in, in Luke 14. We read, we will rejoice when we are persecuted for his name. Did you get that? We will rejoice when we are persecuted for his name. This is part of following Jesus. This is part of counting the cost. When it comes to homosexual marriage, you are persecuted for it by half the church that affirms and says we don't judge and then we're saying but you're not preaching a gospel that saves if you're preaching that 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 is part of god's creation then you're in jeopardy of preaching for satan You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a lampstand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. We can see the end of this chapter. It's so beautiful because the Pharisees are, are trying to trap him. Some of the Pharisees warned him so not all pharisees some of the pharisees were learning some i'm sure some of them went 180 degrees for him but here's who came to him the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him they knew somebody was speaking the 100 percent truth they knew he was god in the flesh they probably didn't understand it yet the disciples didn't even understand it yet they were hoping my kingdom come now uh fix it all now they didn't even understand that's why uh, the apostle born out of due time paul who had the old testament memorized helps open up scripture for for all of them and us to see oh my gosh as the Gentiles, we are being fulfilled, grafted in from the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that, that it extends to all nations. And that's how we're grafted in. So there's just one more teaching, you guys, on the parables. Another thing God's been showing me is about how Jesus was teaching, sit, sit at the lowest seat. So you're not going to fall away if you're consistently looking at how you can lift others up. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We find that in Revelation. There are certain verses that really, you go like this, you go, wow, look at that verse right there in Revelation. And then you can say, the whole, books, the whole book of the Bible points to that. Everything is a testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is saying, it's foretelling the future, and it's all in the Bible. From the beginning, the middle, and the end, it's all foretold. That's why we don't, we don't need, I don't need to put prophet by my name and expect God to show me when the exact time the earthquake is coming, when the exact time things are coming. It's already in the Bible. You know, now it's up to us to go find the mysteries. Yeah, I might get a prophetic word. I've gotten those a lot. But I don't want to bang my chest and say, I have special interpretation. You guys should come to me. That's kind of along the same lines as decreeing New Age stuff. When Jesus is saying, repent follow him and the, the the parables open it up to really show you are you willing to die for the are you willing to die for Jesus are you willing to die for the least of those the ones that have it wrong are you willing to die for everyone like Jesus did I mean that's the uh, that's the that's the question we all have to ask ourselves and what I'm blessed with is I don't want a bunch of likes. I don't want a huge ministry. I don't want any of that. I just got to interview David Hawking, and that's what I took away from that was he is small. And that's what I want to be. I just want to be small. God has blessed me so much. And now that's the best place for me to be. I mean, some of the things I created with a, another producer – they were going to buy it out and put it on own network, Oprah. Um, this lady bought it from us, new age lady. And I thought that was going to make me, I was going to have producer by my name. And that was the sanctification level I was at. I thought I needed that. And thank God it didn't happen.
because maybe I would have like gotten my glory from from the stuff I do instead of not wanting any glory at all. That's another thing that David Jeremiah in one of those books, the book of signs of the apocalypse, he really gives a story and he says, are you doing this for your glory? Are you doing it for his kingdom? Are you doing things to be popular? And I was like, whoa, I never looked at it like that. So God is so awesome in his sanctification process. Right now, I, I just love lifting up other people, their testimonies, because I know the spiritual war. Like I explained how I was when I still had the sword in my hand. I know how it is. I know the enemy is going to come against the, the, the least of these, the, the young turn, the young in the faith. I, I understand that. And so the people that are coming out of new age, I lift them up. I'm like, yes, expose, expose what uh, needs to be exposed in the body of Christ. Let's lift them up. Let's lift up the persecuted Christians. That body is hurting. We're supposed to surround that part of the body. Let's lift up the ex-gang members, the ex-transvestites, the Iranian women that are turning to Jesus Christ. Let's give them these platforms because, boom, there's, there's the light. There is the salt. There is the move of the Holy Spirit. There is, for the mega churches, the answer to your apostasy and needing to be so popular is go back to the foundational stuff. God bless you guys. Hope this made sense. I'll put some links up. God bless you.